You're not going to make knives because girls don't make knives. Their hands will get dirty, their nails will get dirty, and they'll burn themselves, and it's a dirty work. It is, it is, but my dad's a logger, and I grew up logging with my dad, and so dad took no excuses. His, his words were, can't never could do nothing, and the reason was, can't never try. My name is Audra Draper, and I am an American Bladesmith Society Master Bladesmith. So what drew me to knife making was initially just a job uh, working for a ranch. I was being a ranch hand, feeding cattle, uh, mending fence, go for work, and then I went out in the shop one day and saw him working, and he had the forge running. and. I just totally and completely fell in love with the fire. <laughs> the flames were intoxicating for me and I told him I wanted to make knives too and I wanted to play in the forge and he promptly told me that, and I quote, girls can't make knives. <laughs> so um, yeah, then it was a lifelong goal that I had to make knives forever now. <laughs> I love the fire, the ability to just sit back and create from nothing. Even though I may make the knife myself, I got backup here that's, that's ready to fix anything that's not running the way I want it to. It's really good having a mic. <laughs> She's my wife, um, and I, I just try to make her life simpler or easier. That's my job. So I'm a member of the American Bladesmith Society. What they do is they promote the forged blade. Um, they are very much like, I guess you would associate it with like a, an electrician. Um, there's an apprenticeship that you have to perform. After that apprenticeship is over, you can apply for your journeyman. Um, once you pass your journeyman performance test, you can go before the judges at the blade show and present your five knives to the judges. They will review for fit and finish, but if you pass that, then you can be on your way to going for your masters. When you present for your masters, you have to make a Damascus 10 inch or greater blade. It has to be greater than 300 layers of Damascus. You show them that you can make a sharp knife by shaving the hair off your arm. When you're done with that, you cut a one inch hemp rope that's free hanging from the ceiling. You have to cut six inches from the bottom, clean cut. Then you chop through a two by four two times. You have to shave the hair off your arm again to prove that it maintains its edge. And then from there, you put it in a vise and you flex it to 90 degrees. Once you pass that performance, you take your five knives to the judges. Only this time, of those five knives, you have one that is specific requirements and it's an early European quillian style dagger. When I had to make that dagger, it was so stressful. But when I got done with it and the judges looked at it, they just, they really liked it. And it was like, I poured my heart and soul out into that knife. I got my Master Bladesmith rating in 2000. I was the first female Master Bladesmith. I guess I made a little bit of history there. <laughs> Heather got hers in 2010, and the other girls got theirs in like 16. So there are four female master bladesmiths in the world right now. I'm not positive about the entire master bladesmiths, how many there are, but I believe it's in the 160 range. When I just started making knives, attractive young lady, early 20s, and you're breaking into a field where you've got a bunch of crusty old men, for lack of a better term. At the shows, we ran into this problem multiple times. They thought that I was making the knives and that she was just the pretty face selling the knives. They just didn't believe that I was making these knives. And it was, I was angry, I was frustrated that people weren't really taking me seriously. So when I saw the masters and met the masters, they were all very distinguished older gentlemen in those days and nobody gave them guff. Nobody said, mm-hmm, who really makes your knives? <laughs> they all just took it for granted. They were a master bladesmith, they made these knives. And I'm like, that's what I'm gonna have to do because I am sick and tired of people not believing that I made these knives. So going for my masters gave me the credibility with 
People, when they came to my table, or at least those who knew what a master bladesmith was, it gave me credibility in their eyes. She'd almost become a bit of a celebrity, you know, and that wasn't what she was after, but it was, it was nice to see people accept her, you know, and all the hard work had paid off. All of a sudden it opened up so many different avenues and the teaching really after getting my master's that's really it shot us into that direction but it wouldn't have happened if it weren't for all the articles and stuff that were written that kind of got my name out there to the whole world instead of just my little town of Riverton, Wyoming where you know, nothing happens in Riverton, Wyoming. <laughs> We met a gal from Ohio who was a teacher, and she asked me if I would be interested in teaching a course with somewhere between you know, four and eight students, mostly girls, that would come from the college and they'd come to Wyoming. And I said, sure. We hosted our first real class here at the house, and all of these girls were struggling college students, so we put them up here in the house, and they got to spend seven days in the shop. They all left with knives, and they loved it, and from that day forward, we just started getting more and more calls about, could you host another class? And the next thing we know, it seems like classes seem to be um, something we're doing, like, I don't know, every month or two now. To watch her instruct is really fun. She just enjoys every aspect of that, and, and she's an awesome teacher. She, she has the patience. She enjoys sharing her knowledge. I, I think people enjoy the experience with her. She, she makes friends real easily with people, and she's laughing and joking with them, and, and it's, it's a good experience for everybody. them have never even been near a forge so it's a pretty big learning experience for some of them but I love watching the expression on their face and the pride they take in creating their own custom knife the way the handle they want the shape they want in my opinion she's the best because she'll take the time to show you what what to do from start to finish and doesn't just give you say you need to make this knife we're, we're gonna do that it gives you gives you your the freedom to go do what you want to do when they take it out of the etchant, the look on their face is like, oh my God, look at what I made. I try to stay out of the way and, and help where I need to. She'll be in the house and, and we'll, they'll be eating breakfast or visiting or something like that. And when she comes out in the class, the forge is lit, the billet's ready to go, the press is running, everything is set, you know, and I've, I've come out and all, prepared all that stuff ahead of time. And so I just try to keep the classes moving as smoothly as possible. Anything that goes wrong, Mike's right there and he's got it fixed for me. It, as a matter of fact, pretty much everything in my shop he's fixed for me. He's built me grinders, he's built the press, he's built the forges. So we work pretty well as a team and, and uh, that's made probably my success right there is that I have a pretty good team going. She's driving the bus and I just try to keep the wheels on the bus. So that's kind of where the wheels on the bus thing comes on. So that's what I do is I, I keep stuff moving and uh, it's, uh, it can be a challenge some days. Every knife that goes out my door, I want it to be the best that I can possibly make. The best quality, best function. I want the cutting edge to be able to hold an edge, but I don't want the spine to be so hard that it's going to break the minute they get in there and try and wedge those ivories out of their elk. Um, I want it to be beautiful because there's no reason why it can't be beautiful. It can have beauty and function. Audra has developed her own unique style. You know, she, uh, she likes curves, she likes flowing lines, she likes to use natural materials, she tries to keep it as smooth and functional as possible. So her, 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 her style and her design kind of follow along those lines. There's not one place in that blade show I could be that I would ever feel alienated because I have so many people there that are like family. And that's the whole ABS, that it really is like a family for me. They've, they have welcomed me in. It took a while to break through it, but I am just the little sister of the bladesmith community. <laughs> 
There's a lot of women making knives now that are enjoying the acceptance that she worked so hard for, you know. I mean, she kind of paved the way. It's not, it's, people are like, so what are you going to do when you retire? And I'm like, I make knives. I plan on making knives until I can't swing a hammer anymore, and then I got a trip hammer, so. <laughs>
I think I have had over 70 students to date. Students under Jack start by learning how to hold the string to create the right tension while braiding. He teaches them the four string round braid. The four string round braid is the most difficult thing for a new student to catch on to. Once they learn the four string braid, then I'll graduate them into an eight string, 12 string or whatever. And uh, that is relatively easy after they learn the, the muscle memory of braiding four strings. I will start teaching them different knots. And uh, to me, there's about four knots that uh, will cover about anything you want to do. I would normally start them out making range till they get very adept at, at braiding and then go into a bozal or a head stall or whatever that they desire to make. Jack is wonderful. Jack, uh, he never lets you settle for less. I, I made a set of reins and I took them in to Jack. I was so proud of them. He said, you satisfied with them? I says, yeah, I guess I'm satisfied. He said, no, you're not. You're never satisfied. He always pushes us to do the very best we can. In 2006, Jack was encouraged to seek a grant through Wyoming Arts Council to work with an apprentice to teach rawhide braiding more in depth. Now he's working with an apprentice on his sixth such grant. I wanted to learn how to make my own gear for my horses, for my saddles, and be able to fix my gear. Soliana is, is uh, very enthused about it. Uh, she told me once that she could just live in here doing that type of work. And the process now teaching her the multiple string knot. And once she learns that, she will have a, enough knots to do most any type of work that she needs to do. She's, she's really doing a good job and is really dedicated. He's super patient, lets you figure it out, but also guides you if you can't figure it out. If I've had a rough day, I can go out into my shop and cut rawhide, and next thing you know, all, the, all, the, all your problems are gone. I really like braiding. It's very meditative. You have to um, single-handedly focus on it. If you get a little distracted, you can tell in the braid that you didn't maintain the same tension, the same pull. Uh, so I, I like the focus that it takes. I have found that uh, if I'm kind of, kind of keyed up and so forth and uh, uh, television not worth watching, I'll come out to the shop and sit down and do a little braid work an hour or two and, and uh, I'm more relaxed when I get through and I can uh, just kind of just feel better all over, especially if you accomplish something that you've been trying to do, like you finish a nice knot or something, you really have a, a, a feeling of gratification on that. Jack has spent a lifetime creating beautiful and functional rawhide horse gear. By passing on his knowledge, he's preserving an invaluable skill for the next generation. My first experience with Neon was calling a guy at a sign shop in Livingston, Montana. I called him, told him who I was, what I was interested in, and asked him if he would be interested in having an apprentice. And he said, women can't bend glass, and he hung up. And I was like, whoa, challenge accepted. <laughs> it's always been a man's world. It's just up to women, I think, to just let them know we're here and we're not going anywhere. For the few that have done stuff like that, you know, there's been more people who are accepting and could care less if I'm a man or a woman or an alien. They don't care. They just, they just want somebody to keep Neon alive, too. So it's been more accepting than it has anything else. My name's Connie Morgan. I'm a human, I'm a woman, I'm a mom, and I'm a tube bender. And I live in Casper, Wyoming. So when I first moved to Casper, I got a job at a sign shop um, and was so grateful that they had a neon plant already in place and set up and ready to go. The owner of the sign company stated, he's like, you know, we probably won't do a lot of neon. It's mostly just repairs. People aren't buying anything like that anymore. It's just, you know, it's dead. And I kind of adopted that because I was busy raising a family. And as my kids got a little bit older, I needed a side hustle. And I was like, oh, you know, I can utilize this neon plant that's here. And I had to talk to myself and say, 
It's not dying. I can do something to help bring it back, even if it's just occasionally making a sign here or there, repairing one. I just told myself, you don't need to believe what other people tell you about it. Even in Wyoming, it can be done where you can make people see the value of it. So tube bending is basically you get long sticks of glass, and they're four feet to five feet long. They're hollow tubes, and that's where the term tube bender came from because you're bending it in a hot flame. You bend the tube. I use a ribbon burner, a knife fire, and a hand torch, and I heat the glass up just till it, I don't know, you get a feel for it. It's not easy. <laughs> it's a lot of hand-eye coordination. The goal of the tube bender is to keep the integrity of the glass. So you're wanting to keep the wall thickness the same. You're trying not to stretch out the glass. As you heat it up in a fire, you kind of, I, I was taught that you use a technique called gathering and it's where you're just gently, as it's heating, you're just gently rolling it and kind of pushing it together. As gravity takes over, it makes it sink, so it starts to stretch. So that's why, you know, when you see me roll it in the fire, like it's, <laughs> it looks all wobbly and I'm trying to keep it together and get it hot enough all at the same time so that when you come to the table with your glass, it's hot enough that it lays flat. So you use the different fires for different types of bending. Smaller bends, like double backs and um, rises and turns, you can do in your knife fire. Um, these big long sections are done in the ribbon burner. When I first started doing it, gravity would completely take over and my glass would just sink and stretch out. And you know, you're just trying to, you're going through a lot of glass, just trying to get the feel for it. Because you don't want to bend glass if it's too cold. It'll be stressed, it'll break. I blow into the tube to keep the integrity of the glass the same. If I don't blow in the, into the tube, uh, the glass will collapse on itself. As soon as it cools down, it'll break. You need to keep the, the hollowness of the tube the same all the way around, no matter what kind of bend you're trying to do. Like some bends will get narrower and stuff like that, but your whole object is to keep the integrity of the tube the same. So there's, there's lots of different things going on when you're bending glass, it's a lot to think about. The bombarding process is to clean out the tube, um, to get all the impurities out of it, suck all of the air out of it, put it under a complete vacuum, and then you put the gas into it, and that's how you get the light. You get it through argon gas, neon gas. I think some people use helium, xenon, krypton to achieve different looks and effects with the gas. As much as I love the brightness and the, I love to light up my signs, for me the best part is bending it and that it's, it's really hard. It's not an easy craft, an easy trade to learn. The school was only 14 weeks long and you're like, 14 weeks is not enough. And that's when you hope to get a job with somebody who will continue to teach you. I'm, as far as I know, the only person that makes neon signs in Wyoming. Wyoming's not the most populated state in the country, but you know, to be the only person doing it, it just shows you how it's a dying art. It's dying because of technology. There's more advancements in LED signs, um, can get things made cheaper. And that's all fine and good, and we all know that technological advancements happen in every generation, and things die out because of that. The neon art form, craft, has not changed a lot since uh, it was invented. I mean, there's advancements in neon as well, but it's pretty much kind of made the same way as it was when it was first invented, and I think that's a cool part of it, that it hasn't changed a lot. Because you can buy, you know, there's LED signs you can buy now that look like neon, they make it look like neon, they advertise it as neon. It's not neon. There's no craft went into making any of that. <laughs> it's aggravating when they tout it as neon, and it's not. When I see an old sign that's you know, in ruins or the paint's missing or the neon's all broken. It's just this like part of me that just wants to fix it up and make it shine again. I like the old signs because I think it, it reminds me and other people of a different time. A heyday of neon, I just, I guess I just want to keep that alive and redoing those old signs kind of does that for me. It's what I'm trained to do. It's what I know how to do. There was many years where it was, uh, the main income for my family and I. I made a living at it. I was able to make 
a living out of it. What motivates me to keep going is my kids. Their dad left almost four years ago and I realized that, okay, everything's up to me now. My kids motivate me and the desire to not work for anyone else. I don't want to be a cog in someone else's wheel. I want to be my own wheel. If something calls to you and you have a passion for it, you're going to find a way to make a living at it. And if it never feels like a job, neon never feels like a job to me, especially now working for myself. Even though it is and there's more pressure now, it doesn't feel like a job. I feel blessed to come in here every day and be able to do what I do. If someone out there has a passion for it, then go for it. Don't let anybody tell you no.